Okay, hi, so welcome to this video on enzymes. And this video is, of course, for the 9 to 1 new specification for GCSE biology. All right, now, first of all, what is an enzyme? Now, in blunt, short terms, an enzyme is a biological catalyst. Okay, it is a biological catalyst. Okay, now what does that mean? If you study chemistry, which you probably do, then you should know what a catalyst is. Okay, so a catalyst is a substance which speeds up the rate of a reaction without being used up in the reaction. Okay, and so a biological catalyst is just one which is made inside a cell. Okay, so an enzyme is basically something which is going to speed up the rate of reactions and it's not going to be used up during a reaction. Okay, now one thing to note is that all enzymes are proteins. Okay, that's true. All enzymes are proteins, so they're obviously made by the cell themselves. Okay, so all enzymes are proteins. Yet yeah, these are composed of chains of amino acids. Okay, which fold in 3D to form a an overall structure. Okay, now that's important because we're going to come on to in a second how enzymes actually work, right? So, just make sure you're aware that all enzymes are proteins. Those enzymes have 3D shapes, which are very important for their structure, okay? And you can call an enzyme a biological catalyst. Now let's have a look at a very simple diagram of an enzyme. Okay, so this on the left, this is your enzyme. Okay, now the important thing to note is that enzymes are specific, right? They're specific for a particular substance. Yep, in chemistry sometimes you see catalysts which are not specific, right? They just speed up the rate of any reaction. Well, in in uh, in living things, we need to be much more precise than that, right? If you just sped up the rate of all the reactions going on inside a cell, then you'd end up with loads of stuff that you don't want, right? You'd end up with loads of reactions happening which you don't really care about that much or in a given situation, you're not too fussed about them. And so an enzyme makes sure that you're only speeding up the specific reaction that you want to speed up. All right, and the substance, basically, which is involved in the reaction that the enzyme wants to speed up, we call it the substrate. Okay, you can think of it in chemical terms as the reactant, but we just call it the substrate. It basically means the substance that's going to bind onto your protein, okay, which in this case is your enzyme. Now, how this actually works is the enzyme has a specific shape, right? And here, this part of your enzyme, I'm going to rub this out in a second, is called the active site, right? The active site. This is pretty much the most important part of your enzyme. The active site has a very specific shape, and that is where your substrate is going to fit, okay? If the active site does not fit your substrate, then the enzyme is not going to work. Right, and we'll get on to scenarios where that happens in a little bit. But let me just show you. So our substrate, uh, that's not what we wanted. Here we go. Our substrate, okay, in the cell will be buzzing around and it could end up doing this. Okay. Notice how that shape completely fits. Right, it's fit inside our enzyme. Now the enzyme can work and it can cause that substrate to react. Okay, it will react and form a product. And here we go, that substrate may have formed a product. Don't worry about these shapes, it's just a representation. And then that product will leave, okay? It's left, and so that reaction has been catalyzed, right? The reaction's happened, it's been sped up by the enzyme. And then what can happen is more of the substrate, okay, can then come, and that process will just repeat itself, right? And it'll happen over and over again, and notice the enzyme hasn't been used up, and so it can keep working. All right, so that's great. We know what an enzyme is. Now, there is a name for this kind of representation, right? This model of substrate fitting inside enzyme before it does its job, okay? And that is the lock and key model, right? So this is called the lock and key model. Let me just rub this out. We know what that is now. Okay, the lock and key model. Okay, what that says is substrate has a specific shape which is complementary 
to the active site of the enzyme. Okay, so basically, lock and key is exactly as it sounds. A key fits a specific lock, and so a substrate fits a specific enzyme, fits in perfectly, reacts, and then leaves. All right, and so that's all well and good. It's a simple way of looking at it. In reality, it's not quite that simple. In reality, the model which is more accepted, sorry, is called the induced fit model. And the induced fit model basically says that when the substrate enters the active site okay so basically the shape is still important they do have a complementary shape okay the shape of the active site changes slightly to better okay i'm going to say or tighter fit the substrates okay so the reason that's called an induced fit is because what we're saying is that the substrate kind of fits in there but it's not like a, a lock and key where it's a perfect fit it kind of fits in but the fact that the substrate is in the active site causes the active site itself to change shape remember we said that the pro the uh, the enzyme is a protein and it's made up of all these chains of amino acids which are folded up basically the folds kind of change shape to to um lock that substrate in place they kind of hug it if you like and then that means that the fit is even better and then the reaction will happen Okay, lastly for this video, you need to know uh, different factors which affect enzyme action, right? So basically, different factors which affect how an enzyme performs. Okay, now, one of those is temperature. Okay, so temperature. Yep, now, you should know that as you increase the temperature, the rate of a reaction will increase. Okay, this is kind of obvious. Uh, you need to know the, the reason for that in terms of particle theory. I'm not going to go through all of it here. I have separate videos on that, right? But as you increase the temperature, the rate of a reaction will increase. That is also true with an enzyme-controlled reaction up to a certain point, right? And this is important. After a certain temperature, okay, basically your particles or your atoms inside your protein have too much energy. They vibrate too much. And this can actually cause the bonds inside the protein, right, which hold the protein together, to break. And if that happens, the shape of your enzyme is changed, and that means that the active site has changed shape. If the active site changes shape, then your substrate will no longer fit inside the active site, right? Let me show you a quick um, example. Let's say I get rid of that substrate, right, and I get rid of the active site here. Now... Let's say that I've heated this up, okay, and it's changed shape. And as a result, it kind of looks like this, right? This is obviously just an example. Now, our substrate looks something like, I'm going to have to remember now, something like that. This is not going to be perfect, but it was ish like that. And, oh, no, there we, oh, God, here we go. Now, what if our substrate comes in? Look, it just doesn't fit, right? It clashes, it just doesn't fit, and that means that the enzyme is just not going to work. And there's a name that we give an enzyme which is permanently changed shape like this, and that is denatured. Okay, so I'll just type you a quick explanation there. Boom, there we go, that was lightning fast typing. So when the temperature increases, the rate of um, enzyme controlled reaction also increases. However, if the temperature goes too high, vibrations of atoms within the protein causes bonds to break and the enzyme therefore changes shape, okay? The active site changes shape and so the substrate can no longer fit, right? When this has happened and the substrate can't fit, then the enzyme has been denatured, right? That's the word that you're really after, denatured. That basically means a permanent change of shape so that the enzyme no longer functions. Now, there is one more variable which can also cause an enzyme to denature, and that is the pH. Okay, so enzymes basically have an optimum pH, and if the pH goes too far above or too far below this pH, then the same thing happens, right? The bonds break, and you get a change of shape of your enzyme. Okay, so if the pH is too far above or below the optimum pH of an enzyme, right? Just to be clear, the optimum pH is the pH at which the enzyme is working best and which the structure is basically optimum, okay? So, above or below the optimum pH of an enzyme, the bonds break and the enzyme 
changes shape. If the active site has changed shape so that the substrate can no longer fit, then the enzyme has been denatured. Okay, now going back to temperature, sometimes you'll be asked to draw um, or to recognize a graph of temperature versus rate of reaction when you're dealing with an enzyme. I'll actually draw this below so we've got some room. Okay, so here is a set of axes. Okay, so we've got temperature on the bottom and rate of reaction on the top. Now, if we start off at zero degrees Celsius, right, the reaction is going to be really slow at zero degrees Celsius, but it could still be happening like a little bit. But as you increase the temperature, the rate of reaction goes up, up and up and up and up and up and up, up and up and up and up and up, until it reaches its optimum. Okay, and this, at least in the enzymes in a human, is 37 degrees. Surprise, surprise, because that's our body temperature. So this is when the rate of reaction is highest. Now, after this, the bonds start breaking. Okay, to, to begin with, uh, the bonds are breaking, but the overall shape hasn't been completely deformed. So the rate of reaction does go down, but it doesn't completely stop. But then as you get hotter and hotter and hotter, then it gets too hot. The active site's fully changed shape, and now the substrate can no longer fit, and the rate of reaction is zero. The reaction completely does not happen anymore because the enzyme has been denatured. Right, and this here is known as the optimum temperature. Okay, the optimum temperature. In this enzyme, it's 37 degrees. For different organisms, which live in different environments, their enzymes may have different optimum temperatures. Okay, so just be aware of that. All right, and lastly, you can also um, be asked about graphs to do with pH rather than temperature. Now, the optimum pH of an enzyme basically depends on what the enzyme is. Most of the enzymes in humans will have an optimum pH of around about 7, maybe just above 7, because that's the pH of our blood, right? Around 7.4. Now, that might look something like this. So if this is pH 7, okay, you'll have the rate of reaction will increase. And this is the optimum, and then it decreases, and then it goes down, 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 and this is where it's denatured again, right? But notice it's denatured on both sides, and that's why it's different to the temperature graph, right? If we look up here, because if the pH goes too high or the pH goes too low, then the bonds break and the enzyme has fully denatured, right? So like a, an, en an enzyme, sorry, <coughs> excuse me with an optimum pH of 7 will not survive in the stomach where the optimum pH is two, sorry where the pH of the environment there is 2 because you've got stomach acid whereas in the blood it will survive because the pH is 7.4 right so basically the optimum pH of the enzyme tells you a little bit about the environment you're going to find the enzyme in and that's important because we have an enzyme in our stomach called pepsin right now, pepsin is a protease, it breaks down proteins, and it's found in our stomach. Now, I'm going to draw its graph on this same set of axes, okay? Now, our stomach produces hydrochloric acid, okay? And the, the pH of our stomach is around about pH 2, yeah? Pepsin looks exactly the same, except its optimum is around about pH 2, right? I'm just squishing this together. I should probably draw that a little bit higher. Like so. Over the top, down etc etc that's what it's going to look like right the graph looks exactly the same but where the optimum ph is completely different okay this is the optimum ph of pepsin which is around about ph2 whereas this here is the optimum ph of your other enzymes and and that's around uh, ph7 okay so Different enzymes like to be in different environments, okay? They work best at certain pHs, and they work best at certain temperatures, right? Those are the optimums. What those optimums are depend on the organism, right? If the organism lives in a hot environment, then its enzymes might have an optimum, which is which is quite hot, might be 70 degrees, okay? Whereas for humans, it's our body temperature, which is 37 degrees, okay? And so it's important you know the difference and can explain that. Okay, perfect. Now, just in summary, an enzyme, let's go back up, right? An enzyme is a biological catalyst, right? In a diagram, it will look somewhat like this, okay? The induced fit model is really how they work, right? A substrate comes in, the enzyme kind of changes shape to fit around it, and then uh, the reaction can occur, okay? The rate at which an enzyme-controlled reaction um, goes... 
uh, is affected by the temperature and by the pH. And that varies between enzymes, right? But know that when an enzyme is denatured, the rate will completely go down because the reaction will no longer be happening as the active site has changed shape and the substrate can no longer fit. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So I hope that did make sense. If it didn't, then feel free to post a comment in the box below or send me a direct email. But as usual, please do like and subscribe because it really does help me and you'll be notified when new videos become available. But thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and look forward to seeing you in the next one.